Good, man. How are you? I'm all right. I'm all right. Good, good. Appreciate you coming and talking to the kids, man. We got a bunch of people tuned in. They want to hear your story. And there's a lot of questions that we got, you know, in pressing times like this. And so we always try to rely on staples in the community and people that have been there for a long time, been able to impact a lot of kids and, and impact the community in general. They want to pick your brain. So um, what I told everybody is that, um, you know, you and I will kind of be going through and some questions, then we'll be picking through some of our favorite questions that we got from the kids at the end. And we'll both sure. kind of vote in terms of who we felt asked some really good questions. But I got some questions that, uh, that I got lined up for you and we'll roll through those first. Sure. Ready? Let's do it. All right. So my first question for you is what made you choose UW to go to college? I chose UW um, for a number of reasons. The biggest reason is I wanted to be close to family. Um, and I went to Garfield High School, which is 10 minutes away from uh, University of Washington. And uh, I wanted to play in front of my, my family, my friends. Also, I wanted to start uh so to say, my own legacy. Like, I, I wasn't looking around. I feel like UW was a football school at the time. Right. And I know a group of dudes that I grew up with were really good in basketball, and I felt like if two or three of us decided to go there, we could change it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, it just needed to be one guy to, to, to say, I'm going to stay home. So were you, the, were you the first guy out of your group to, to commit to UW? I was. Got you. And what was your relationship like with the guys? I know Nate went to Beach. He wasn't there. I know you went to school with, you know, went to high school with, with B-Roy. But what was your relationship like with those guys, even though they went to a different high school? Well, we were all really close. Uh, Nate played for the Gary Payton All-Stars with me. Um, and then my first year when I played at Rainier Beach, um, my second year at Rainier Beach, uh, Nate was a freshman. So we had got really close. So I knew those guys really good. And, you know, the Seattle area is really small, so. Right. Through, the, you know, through the rings of coming up and playing against the same guys over and over again, you you you, you gain relationships and and uh, we form bonds. And so once I decided to come and, you know, we had a ch coaching change, um, which was my sophomore year at University of Washington, a new coach came in and he was kind of like, who was who? And I was like, man, go get that guy. Go get that guy. Go get that guy. Right. And, uh, yeah, fortunately enough, we were able to grab a couple of them. Right. Are you how? What's the age difference between you and Nate again? Just one year. Got you. What mm -hmm. about you and B. Roy? Just one year. They're they're uh, one class behind me. Okay. Got you. Got you. Yeah. Got you. Where else were? What other colleges were you considering? Well, earlier that earlier that um, that spring, I had I, I was getting mail from every Pac-12 school. I kind of waited really late, and the, cause some of the scholarship offers that I had kind of dried up. Mm -hmm. Um. I mean, UW recruited me early in the spring, and then they kind of fi filled their uh, rec recruiting recruiting class. So I was kind of left out. I was, I had Xavier, Pitt, like some schools back east, and I wasn't going back there. But uh, right, I remember we had played uh, Franklin High School, um, uh, uh, and one of the rivalry games, and um, the Husky coaches were there. And then after the game, the, their top re recruiting coach called me. He was like, man. Are you ready to stop playing and be a Husky? And at that right. point, I was like, "Yeah, I, I'm ready to right. stay." Home. Right, I got you. What was your What was your role like as a freshman coming in there? You dub. It was weird, man. My role uh, when I came there, there was a guy in front of me named Curtis Allen, and Curtis, the year before, he was the point guard. He was a All Conference point guard as a freshman. So coming in, everyone was telling me it was crazy for me to go to University of Washington because. Right. I was a point guard. So it was like, this guy's only a sophomore. You'll never play. Right. But uh, no disrespect to Curtis. I thought Curtis was a good player. You know, as Curtis played for the older CAY team, which was my little league team, I just felt like I could beat him out through hard work and all of that stuff. I felt like my will would, would eventually take over and I would get the position in. And fortunately enough, oh, with 10 games left, I was the starting point guard from University of Washington my freshman year. Freshman year, mm -hmm. what, what was it like coming off the did and who was your who was your head coach for all four years? I had uh, Bob Bender, who's now working in the NBA. He's been in the NBA for the last twelve years, and uh, and then Romar Lorenzo Romar was my coach as a sophomore from sophomore sophomore, on. sophomore yeah. through it. Got you, mm -hmm. got you. What what did, did your role? Did your role? I know you obviously we were a full time starter after ten game with ten games left into your freshman year. What did you notice? 
in terms of your role changing from the beginning of freshman year to the end, aside from you starting? Like, was the culture communication different? Were practices different? You know what it was? I, I always was a vocal leader. So even when I wasn't playing, um, I remember got uh, leaders on the team like Grant Leap and Will, uh, Wilcox. They would always come to me and say, man, the things that you say are very inspirational. You're saying the right stuff, man. You, you know, you're going to be a great leader. So I felt like I was one of the leaders of the team even when I wasn't playing. Um, right. I would always speak like I was one of the leaders, and I would work hard like I was one of the leaders. And then once they finally gave me the ball, um, it was just, like, natural for me. It was, it was a natural progression. Um, nothing really changed. I just was playing more. So Right, right. When you when you were choosing your schools, obviously, you know, every every competitive basketball player wants to go to a competitive school, but the you know, in my opinion, aside from winning, you know, you want to be on the floor and you want to play. Mm -hmm. I know you obviously did your research in terms of what who was there position wise and you found out that Curtis was there and whatnot. Um was your did the were the, how open do you feel the coaches were in terms of, you know, being realistic with your ability to fight for playing time during your freshman year? You know, um, to be honest with you, man, to be honest with you, once I got to University of Washington, once we first started having practice and stuff, it kind of bothered me. Uh, no matter what Curtis did, he was still the starter. No matter sure. what I did at practice, he was still For the sure. starter. So that kind of affected me as a freshman. Uh, but uh, it didn't break my will. Um, I stayed with it, stayed with it, and uh, – I think when you when to answer your question, I think when it's that type of situation, you, you got to assess everything properly. I know now with transferring being so prevalent amongst uh, amateurs, um, you know, people don't want to fight for anything anymore. You know, right. you just like, man, it's not the place for me. Right. And uh, everywhere, every place isn't for everybody. So I, I'm not going to knock people who do transfer because every place isn't for everybody. Right. But. There is something to be said for for the athlete that stays and fights for something and and, and conquers it. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. We we try to teach, preach a lot of you know. There's life lessons that in basketball and really just competitive sports in general that no other venue, no other internship. You know, I'm obviously you and I are obviously biased to basketball, but there's things that you and I, I think you would both agree that our basketball experience shaped the men that we are. No doubt. Right? So, to, and that goes down to the how we interact with other people, how we father our children, how mm -hmm. we, you know, work with the, our youth that are coming up in the next generation. All that was to do with our experiences, the good and the bad, and how mm -hmm. we went through basketball. No doubt. So, no doubt. Um, how did your, how would you say that you, did you feel like you ever at any point, even though, you know, you went through, Curtis was the guy, you know, it was already explained to you that, that did you ever consider tra transferring or you knew it and there's no way? Uh, no, I never felt at one point I was going to transfer. Um, I felt like I just needed an opportunity and, you know, I would get small opportunities in big games where we were either, we were losing by a lot or we were winning by a lot and I would always play well. And I was just, I would always tell myself if I just have more of an opportunity when it mattered, I can right. show it. Right. I can show it. And then I got an opportunity. Curtis fouled out at Washington state. He fouled out at Washington State. I got in the game. It was late in the game. My freshman year, I got in the game. I was fouled with a three-point shot. We were down three points. Mm -hmm. I made my first free throw, missed the second one, and made the third one, and we ended up losing the game by two. Mm -hmm. Same thing happened later on in the year when I started starting mm -hmm. against Washington State at home. I was fouled late in the game, and I remember the commentators talking about it. Like, this happened to this freshman a few uh, a few months ago when they played Washington and I made my free throws. Right. So it was just like overcoming adversity and staying with it. I remember that, 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 that sequence sticks out in my mind because it was such a big sequence for me. Right. Uh, as far as just growing and, and uh, maturing into the player that I wanted to be. Right. 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 What, uh, so after from sophomore to senior year, you, you started all the games, right? Mm-hmm. So how would you say your role evolved on the team from sophomore to junior to senior year? Well, my sophomore year, uh, my sophomore year, uh, I knew I was going to be the starter. Uh, so I started and I took more of a, uh, I had more of a larger role. I was scoring um, in the preseason, in the preseason of that year. 
um, I was scoring a lot of points. I had 32 versus Gonzaga. I had 20-something versus UNLV. I had a lot of big games early, so I started scoring. Mm -hmm. And at one point, it was the largest jump that the, in the Pac-12 from year to year uh, from, my, from my scoring. And uh, what happened was as conference went on, uh, other guys around our team started to get better. Right. So Nate Robinson was able to come off the football field, and he played, and he was scoring. Uh, uh, but I ended up having a really good year my sophomore year. I finished the year averaging like 13 points per game, which was like the largest jump in Pac-12 uh, as far as point differential. And then my junior year is uh, when um, our team was really good. We took off mid – I think we we lost our first like – five conference games and then we won like 14 straight conference games mm -hmm. and uh brandon roy emerged uh trey simmons emerged nate turned into the star that he was um and uh we were a really good team we were just a good team all around bobby jones was really good so i kind of was i started to sacrifice towards the end of that year in my scoring because other pieces around me became better Right, and right. somebody needed to sacrifice because we all couldn't be looking to score. Right. And there was, and to be honest with you, there was guys who were better at scoring than I was. I mean, right. I, I could score. I felt I could score, but some guys can just score a little more easier. And a skill that I had, uh, which was to see the floor, they couldn't do that. Not everyone had that. Right. No one had, you know, not everyone has that skill. So right. some have the skill to just score. Some have the skill to do both. I had the skill to be able to be a passer. So that was a kind of role for our team to be successful that I took. Right. And in my senior year, uh, my senior year, we were really good. I want to say we lost five games total. Um, we, we were – Brent Trey was averaging 20 points. Nate was in like 17. Before Brandon tore his meniscus uh, against Oklahoma, he was getting 20 a game. So we were really good. And no one really cared who got the credit. And right. uh, I think that's why we were such a good team. We were all local kids. You know, Mike Jensen played a huge part, didn't score a lot of points, but he, you know, he did a lot of dirty work. Uh, we had a kid named Jamal Williams who's coaching at Garfield now. Mm -hmm. um, Jamal. Yep, yep. And he was really good. He, he, uh, big body. He, every time he got the ball in the low post, he scored, man. He, he shot like 65% from the field. And he was, he was really efficient. And everything just worked, man. It just all worked and it all came together. Um, and the city got behind us and it was a fun, fun time and uh, UW basketball because it was the first time UW basketball really had something special, you know, and no disrespect. I think Donald, uh, when he was in school, but, you know, I think we took the city on a ride with all the local talent right? Um, that it, it hadn't seen. So right. it was fun. Right. It's, a, it's, a, it's unheard of nowadays for people to go 60, 65 percent shooting from the field, man, mm -hmm. especially especially big dudes down there. Was was Jamal starting? Jamal was coming off the bench. We started so uh, we started Mike Jensen and Bobby Jones. Uh, Brandon Roy was the starter uh, until he, he tore his meniscus. And when he tore his meniscus, Trey Simmons kind of uh, ascended and he was getting 20 a game. So when Brandon came back off of his meniscus, he never was he never really fully got full strength of his of his leg until later later in the year so right. he was like our fifth starter he played right. more minutes than all of us but he just came off the bench right. um, he kind of did everything he subbed in for me he bring the ball up we throw the ball in the post um, he was another guy who had the skill to score and pass so we kind of used him all over the floor did Nate play more of the two Nate played more the off guard but um I will say this when we were pressed a lot you know, Nate was a one-man press break. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's, the, that's the running back days. Mm -hmm. Got you. Um, when did you know that you wanted to – obviously timing has a lot to do with, you know, trying to make a jump to go play pro. Did you consider leaving earlier ever, or when did you know you wanted to go to the NBA or make that run? I knew I wanted to go to the NBA when I first picked up a basketball, uh, and I knew whatever got in my way of that, I would cut it out of my life. Mm -hmm. um, so no one – no person, no object, no nothing was going to tell me that I wasn't going to play in the NBA. That's just how – that's just – that was just my focus. I was I was laser locked in about that. And uh, so I always knew that was going to be the case for me. I was going to work for it. I was going to die trying. Uh, but to answer your question, I just, I just think uh, 
I just think like the University of Washington having that platform, first of all, you have to win to get that opportunity. For sure. Um, because everyone's not going to make it the same way. For sure. Um, you know, Nate was drafted. Brandon was drafted. Trey was our leading scorer. He wasn't drafted. He and Trey played, I want to say, 12 or 13 years, high-level Europe, making six figures uh, after, like, year one or year two over there, made himself a really good living. And uh, so everyone has a different path. But I felt like my path, you know, I, I did the minor leagues. You know, I came out of the minor leagues, got an opportunity here and there, um, signed one or two guaranteed contract so went overseas came back so but if i if i'm looking back on it and i had to do it again i wouldn't change anything to be honest with you because i think it formed me into the per person i am today like right. i said you know you know who you are when you go through adversity you figure out who you are right and uh you know it was some adverse times sometimes or at night where I, it was just me and my mirror and i was like man do you really want to keep going for this, you know, or do you want to go overseas and make money and start, you know, uh, building your wealth and, and stuff like that. And there was times where I was like, man, when I got overseas and to, to make money, there was times when I was over there where I was like, am I done with basketball? Because I, I don't, this wasn't my goal. My goal wasn't to, my goal was never to make money playing basketball. My money, my goal was to play at the highest level. Right. So I, it's just all how you, in your mind, which you, how you set things and in my mind it never was a dollar sign about making pros it was always about i playing i'm playing with the best basketball players in the world which me in my mind i feel like i was one of the best basketball players in the world Absolutely. because there's only so many jobs here exactly you have to have that mindset i mean you got people to understand really once you get to that level about how many people have that mindset you know you mm -hmm. look at guys like you know, the Jared Dudleys or whatever, you know, and they think, oh, well, these guys aren't that good. Like, even the guy, the last guys on the bench and the guys that are in the develop in the D leagues, now the G League, they can go somewhere else and go be the best player on the team on a high level. I'll tell you right now, the 12th man on every roster will average 50 in every pro-am. Exactly. It's that simple. Exactly. There is no bums. I remember my first time going to a – my first time – uh, going to a uh, uh, being brought up to the NBA, um, I w it was the Memphis Grizzlies, and uh, there was a kid on the team. Um, he had a funny name; uh, it'll come back to me. And he wasn't playing, and I, he he wasn't getting any playing time. And I was off the team, and for some reason they started playing him, and that man was scoring like twenty five a game for like five straight games. Right. So I always said. You know, I see kids, you know, and they, they don't really know. But, you know, when they're playing video games, somebody may be ranked or rated 64 on a video game and a kid may walk him out. He's a bum. Right. There's no bums in the NBA. Right. There's no right. bums in the NBA. Right. There is not. Right. What was the experience like when you – so did you enter your name in the draft in, after senior year? I did. Uh, I did. Uh, I ended up working out for about 17 or 18 NBA teams. Wow. Um so, is that normal to, to work out for that many teams? It's a good thing. It means you're doing well. Um, when I first finished my senior year, I got invited to the all the, to the top senior camp, which is called the uh, Portsmouth Invitational Camp. They still do and that? They still do it. And it's for all the top seniors. And uh, I wasn't invited to the Chicago pre-draft camp right away, so I had to go there. And I played really well at the at the sport, Portsmouth. I think I had broke the record at the time for assists. I had 17 or 18 assists in one game. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I remember my agent called me after I got home, and he said that uh, was it may have been two or three days after I got home, and he was like, "Man, the Houston Rockets want to work you out." Then I went to I flew to Houston like on Monday, and then I came back, and then it was like another team, and then Detroit, and then I was all over the country, and. Uh, I ended up getting invited to the Chicago pre-draft camp out of that. So um, to answer your question, I think how I played at the invitational camp um, springboarded me to having more workouts. And, you know, a lot of teams were like, we, wow, we didn't know he was as good or wow, you know, right. this dude can be an NBA point guard. So that was my journey as far as uh, the draft went. I didn't get drafted. I thought I was. I worked out three times for the Seattle Sonics. Right. Usually when you work out that many times for a team, uh, they're taking a long look at you. For sure. And I worked. I worked out three times for the Seattle Sonics, and uh, I knew they were gonna have a spot open. 
and crazy, crazy story. So afterwards, I didn't get drafted. Draft night come, came and gone. Three days later, I go up to Green Lake to play basketball outside. Coach Nate McMillan was in there with his son. Mm -hmm. he was, he was a, yeah, he was in there with his son. And it, I was a little pissed off because he had, <laughs> he had three picks in the second round to draft me. Three. Right. And he didn't. He took two guys who probably never even came over to the States. Right. Um, and uh, I seen him. And I, didn't, I, I wasn't sure if I wasn't, was going to go speak or not. Uh, but I ended up going to speak. And he was like, man, I know you're frustrated. I know, you, I, know, I know that hurts you. I know this is your hometown. You worked out great for us. We want to bring you in for summer league and have you with us for summer league. And, uh, you know, see what comes out of that. He was telling me about, at that time, I, I want to say Mike Wilkes or even the Mateen Cleaves or Earl Watson. He was comparing me to those type of guys. Right. Uh, and he was saying, you know, there's a place for you in this league just because you didn't get drafted. Don't worry about it. But me being immature, I was like, yeah, I hear you. And I, right. and I turned the Sonics thing down. Right. In hindsight, I probably should have did that. I ended up going and, and, and do summer league with the Lakers. Mm -hmm. which, which uh, matured into a uh, – uh, I ended up doing training camp with the Lakers. I ended up getting invited to their veteran camp, which I'm not mad at because I was had a chance to be around the late, great Kobe Bryant. Right. And uh, that two months, you know, really, really opened my eyes. Right, right. Why do you say that you think you should have done the, the Sonics one instead of the Lakers one? Because as you start to look back at it you, and how – I'm built. I felt like the city would have rallied behind me had I stayed home. And, and, and uh, you know, Luke Rittenauer was here, who was another Seattle guy. But I felt like the city would have rallied behind me. Uh, I felt like I would have did what I did at the University of Washington, which was grinded my way into playing. Right. And they, you know, Nate knew who I was because the Sonics just always come up to you'd up and play with us in the summertime. So when the Sonics right. were getting ready for training camp, they would send their guys up. I remember Dwayne Casey used to send all their guys up, Rashard Lewis, Ray Allen. They all come right. to pick up with us. Mom was telling me about that. All the time. So I was I was already playing with their guys, so they knew me. Like Coach Casey, he knew me. Right. Um, so he, he would always say, like, you're an NBA point guard. You're an NBA point guard. And right. it kind of gave me a little bit of confidence hearing an NBA coach say that. Come on. But – I'm very excited that I ended up being able to be around Kobe Bryant for two months. Um, I actually was probably one of his favorite rookies at the time because we draft, they had drafted Andrew Bynum mm -hmm. and they had drafted uh, uh, Von Wafer. And okay. both of those guys, they took Von like 37 and Andrew was like the 17th pick. Maybe, well, I'm not sure, maybe earlier, maybe the lottery. But those guys were kind of, you know, they, they, Von wasn't mature. And Andrew was 17 years old, so they didn't know nothing about, like, waking up early and beating everybody to the gym. Right. So I would wake up and get to the gym. We would have – our practices would start at 11. I'd be in the gym at 8.30. Kobe be up there with you. He'd be, he'd be in there. You he'd be in there in the, he'd be in there in a full sweat. Right. And uh, he would see my drive. He would see my drive, and he was like, did you think you was going to beat me to the gym today? Right. And I'd right. be like, man, I thought I was. Right. And that dude be in a full sweat already, already did his weights. You know, he'd be sitting on the side uh, after he do his weights, eating his cottage cheese or whatever right. it may be. Nobody but, ever really knew how early Kobe got to the gym because he was always the first one. Yep. And it made me realize because I thought I would, I thought I was outworking everyone. And I was like, damn, the greatest player in the world is doing it. Is doing this. Actually, he's actually right. doing this. Right. And it, it wasn't a myth. So me and him actually, like, I'll, I'll, he would talk to me a lot. Like he, we would talk a lot, and uh, it was a fun, fun time in my life. I got a chance to be around the late great Kobe Bryant, and you know, I had tweeted some stuff uh, a few months back uh, when Devin Booker had uh, he had got double teamed in a pickup game. Yeah, and, I saw uh, that. He was mad about was, the double team. He was upset about it. We would double Kobe every day in, in practice right. and triple him every day. Right. Right. And he would say stuff like, you better send three guys. Right. Two's not enough. Right. He never complained one time right. about a double team. It different was, breed, man. He's just different. It was just different. So when right. I saw Devin Booker say that, and I think Devin Booker's a great player, unbelievable player, sure. skill set. Borderline all-star. It's just all a, different, a difference in mentalities. Right. 
Right. Difference in expectations. Kobe mm -hmm. would be offended if you didn't send a double team. Mm -hmm. You know, he was. He, he was. He was literally going in the locker room after practice, and guys who were guarding him all day at practice, he would say, where were you at today? You went at practice. Right, right. And dudes would be like, man, I ain't trying to hear that crap. <laughs> right. How much, of the, how much of the game, as you get to the top, I don't think kids really understand, or really just people in, in general, how much of the game becomes mental? If you had to, if you had to put – this is kind of like a question of the ages, right? If you had to put a percentage on how much of the game is mental versus physical once you get to the NBA, what would you put that at? I think, I think the physical is much higher than people think it is because, it's the, in my opinion, it's the best athletes in the world. Right. Um, but I think what separates, what separates athletes, uh, high-level athletes from each other is the mental piece. I think uh, one of our local guys, maybe two of our local guys are a are, are big example of that, me and Isaiah Thomas and uh, Nate Robinson. For sure. You can't tell Isaiah. You can tell Isaiah Thomas or Nate Robinson they're not five nine. You can't. Right. You can't. Right. You just can't. It, it, it doesn't matter who you are. Them dudes play like they're six six. They believe they're the best player in the world. Right. And they and they and they work their tails off. And you know it's. So I think the that mental part of it is their edge. Right. You know. And I always I used to always have this saying. I said. There's a built-in chip on my shoulder, and I dare you to touch it. Right, right. I dare you to touch it. Right. So that's how they play, and that's what made them the great players they are. And you, if you look back at it, I, Isaiah Thomas was first – I mean, second team all NBA. <laughs> right. Think about that. Right, at 5'9". Think bit. about that. Right. That's um, – he led the damn – he was second, like second or third NBA in scoring. That is unbelievable. That's yeah, unbelievable he, was lead, he was leading – he was leading everybody. He was ahead of Bron – I don't, I'm not sure if Kobe was at the time and, and points in the fourth quarter, too. And he won the Eastern Conference. Right. So, right. and then you had Nate, who was, you know, who came a little bit before Isaiah, who just defied all the odds. You know, right. he won the dunk contest. He Three stood times. up. Like he's, a little, he's a little big man. You right. know, he's a little big man. So, you know, that mental part that they have uh, is unbelievable. And then you got guys like Jamal Crawford, who, you know, he has the longevity that played in this game with longevity, keeping his body right. Dude loves basketball. He's mentally strong because he's been through so much and he's seen different genres of players come in and out the league and he's been able to stick. And that, that's a big testament to him. So I've got a chance to be around and uh, help and touch some really, really inspirational people to myself. Like as much as I inspire other people, they inspire me because I see what they do, and it's like, man, they're moving mountains. Right, right, right. What um, what made you – how did you determine when it was time to try to, you know, hey, I'm doing the, the development league right now. You know, it's I'm not getting caught up like I think I should. Talk about your, your mindset in that because, obviously, you know, you go from success, a lot of success at, um, you know, in college. You guys are winning. You guys went to the Sweet 16, right? Correct. So talk about that kind of mental roller coaster about because, you know, there's a lot of unknowns, right? When you go make that transition from college to the pros, you have people telling you this and then it doesn't pan out. You know, I like you here. I like you there. It's kind of like a mental mind, you know, it messes with your mind a little bit. Mm -hmm. Where was your mindset at, you know, when you're a couple of years in and you had got pulled up and then you got bumped back down, then you have to entertain overseas. What was your mindset like? Uh, at that point, man, I was so locked in to – fulfilling my goals. Um, you know, I, I I got some advice early in my career by somebody I really respect, and he told me everybody's journey is going to be different. And he said the, 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 the analogy he used was he said, stay in your own tunnel. Mm -hmm. And at the time, it didn't make sense to me. He said, because if you start looking in other people's tunnels, you'll get distracted. Right. So I've seen guys who I, I knew weren't better than me get called up, come down, and it can get frustrating if you're looking in their tunnel. Why right. him? Well, you right. don't know why him. I don't know why him. Right. But if I spend a lot of energy trying to figure out why him, I'm putting energy in the wrong place. I need to put, put my energy in getting my own self up. Right. And I, and I think that's what was more important for me um, I had a teammate who, uh, John Lucas the Third, 
And uh, I remember playing behind him when I first got to the D League, and I was like, man, this dude's not better than me. Right. I mean, every day I practice, I was destroying. Right. And and we were in Oklahoma, and he played at he played at Oklahoma State. We were in Tulsa, and I remember he get he got called up, and I was coming off the bench to start my G League career. I was coming, I almost got cut mm -hmm. because in the D League it was so you know the if you got a good point guard and then you, you spend your money on something else. Right. So, and I was rather frustrated. I would practice hard and all that stuff, but I was frustrated and I was, I was voicing my frustration to the coach. Right. So I was like, man, I should be playing. And, and uh, John Lucas got called up and my first three games that I started getting playing time, I had triple doubles. Really? So Were you starting? My first three games, my first three games of starters, I had triple doubles. So after that, John didn't, he didn't remain on the team in the NBA. He came back down, but the coach started playing us together. And then my name kind of got out there. And I remember uh, I was going to the San Antonio Spurs to sign a guaranteed deal. And, uh, and I had a, um, my leg was broke. My shin was broke. So I couldn't pass the physical. I had a, I had a guaranteed deal on the line in 06, was that 06? 06 with the San Antonio Spurs. And for I a couldn't, full year? For a full year. And they wow. ended up taking, that year they ended up taking Jacques Vaughn. Wow. And I, my leg was broke. So that was another curveball. Had to work my way back, get back in shape. Uh, that happened. I ended up having surgery right before the draft. I remember because Brandon Roy got drafted and I, and I was going to go. And I didn't go because I had surgery the next day. Uh -huh. And uh, stayed home, rehabbed. I was trying to get, they said it was going to be a six to seven month recovery. Cause they put a metal rod down my leg. Right. And uh, I was, I was back playing basketball in three months. I ended up, I ended up being ready for training camp and I ended up getting invited to the Charlotte Bobcats training camp. Mm -hmm. I wasn't ready. I was limping all around the camp, but, but you know, another experience. Tough, toughed it out. Did the mm -hmm. wheel thing. Mm -hmm. So how did you, how did you, when did you, when did you realize that you, had you done any coaching before you got under UW? Had you done it work with anybody? I know you did some, you know, you would work some guys out, but had you done any official coaching? I did not. Um, what happened was, as I started to get later in my career, and I even I would start coming home, and we would host these um, pickup runs um, with all the pros. I would I would call all the top pros who I believe were the pros, and we would host these pickup runs. And uh, either before or after, I would put some of the pros through drills. Right. And I started to see my love started to shift. And to well, you, helping other people become better. What year was that? This had to be 2012, 2013. And your first year at UW was when? This was what this one on my sixth year, so 2014. Okay, so a couple, so a couple years, a couple mm -hmm. years before you you made the UW transition. That's when you really kind of got that spark for the enjoyment of working with other people. Absolutely. And then I called, and I remember I got uh, one more. And I had my I had my first child, I had my son. So I remember my last my last situation going to play basketball overseas. I remember calling Lorenzo and I said, Hey coach, I don't love playing like I once loved it. Mm -hmm. And he knew that was a big thing for me because I put so much into the game like right. your most, whole life. Most basketball maniacs do. Right. Um and he and when I said that he was like, Well, what do you feel? I said, I feel like I wanna start coaching mm -hmm. and uh next thing you know i come home i had to finish school i didn't finish school because like i told you i did all those workouts and i dropped out of school right so i had uh like 30 something credits to to complete and i ended up completing them and he hired me and uh now this is what right right, right. right. when you we, we was there any when you knew you were going to get into coaching was there any anywhere else you you would have gone Besides you, Dub, was that all, was that an automatic first first look? You know what? I had a I interview. I actually interviewed with the Boston Celtics for their player development when Brad Stevens was first hired. He ended up bringing his guys from Butler, mm -hmm. and then I had another opportunity where I could have took a um, I could have took a D League a D League job with the 76 Delaware Seventy uh, Sixers. What would you have been doing there? player development, which could have led into a player development job for their 76ers team. Okay. But, uh, but uh, like I said, I had my son. Um, 
I love Seattle. I love University of Washington. I love my city. And uh, I really wanted to give back and help my, my, my home school um, become a name again in college basketball and right. really help like uh, some of the local guys that I really, that I watched come up, become Huskies. I wanted them to become Huskies because I felt like, you know, when we were here, a lot of players wanted to be Huskies. A lot of youngsters wanted to be Huskies because other local stars were Huskies. And I felt like that was important to try to get some of those guys like the DeJounte Murrays of the world and the Jalen O'Wills of the world. Like those guys right. are so important to stay home because there's kids right underneath that look up to these guys. Right. And uh, I've always said it's Washington versus everybody else. Right. So that's, that's just my mindset. I mean, even sometimes when I go out and watch AAU games and I see some of our local teams get into it with other teams, sometimes right. I forget Sometimes I forget I'm a coach. Right. I'm like, hey, man, hey, that's, that's Washington versus you. So exactly. I'm, I'm such a homer. It was an easy decision for me to stay on. Right. Speaking of speaking of baby boy, man, he said he said, Dub C, you're a legend, bro. You know, I'm thankful for you forever. He's tuned into the live. He is an unbelievable kid, and I'm so proud of him. Uh, you know, no one really knows his background, but he's divide, he's defied all adversity, and uh, the sky's the limit for that kid. I'm so proud of that kid. For sure, people don't understand how difficult it is for for an organization like the Spurs to back you and to tend to put you as the head of their future as their point guard. No so doubt, how and not that is. not only that. I mean, he's going into a, a situation where. He's around nothing but mature, mature players, and uh, and he became he became one of their favorites right away. Even the older guys, they loved him right away. Right, and that's a testament to to how he was raised. For sure, that's a testament that that those type of testaments goes goes beyond you know the court. That's that's personality and characteristic type testaments. No doubt, no doubt. Got you, man. We got some. We got a couple questions. We going that the kids. The kids have been blowing us up with questions, man. We going. We I know we are a little longer than what we had anticipated, man. There's a lot of good content, man. A lot of good questions being asked. Go ahead, so, soon. Let me try to find a charger before I before I lose you. I got you. All right. So let's start looking through some of the questions here. So one of the questions that I'm seeing a lot of people ask is um, a lot of kids are asking where you developed kind of not necessarily where you, but how you suggest kids de can develop mental toughness. Because I think, you know, mental toughness in competitive sports, you know, you, ha you have to have a tough mindset in terms of, you know, when you get knocked down, you get back up, right? Uh -huh. um, I think some of that is innate from a personality, st personality standpoint, and some of that has to do with kind of how you're raised and your environment and what you're surrounded right. by. Right. But not everyone is grows up the same way. So, what would you say is your advice, if you will, to kids that want to, that know the necessity of mental toughness, and how do, how would you say you can work on that as a, as an athlete, young athlete? Mental toughness. Um, there, there's you know, there's so many different studies on mental toughness. Um, unfortunate, I've never really, I've never really read into any of them. My mental toughness personally came from, you know, watching my mom struggle. And and I felt like, you know, if she can do it, if she can work two jobs, if she can do this and she can get up and go to work every morning and catch the bus when she didn't feel like it, I felt like, you know, I would go – I always would go in my backyard or wherever with the park or shoot. I would always say, like, if I make this shot, I'm going to do this. Like, I, I, I kind of built it brick by brick brick right, by brick right. and i felt like like i said like nothing was gonna break that like right no matter what you know and they say uh if you really love the game or you love something whenever you really love something and, and it's like pure you'll be willing to go lengths for it absolutely you'll be willing to go lengths for it and then, and then like mental toughness comes from that like so, so maybe your mental toughness won't come at basketball Right. Maybe you like you. Maybe you're easily broken in basketball. Maybe you're like, man, because you don't want it that much. So right. you're breaking that. But maybe your mental toughness will come like well, we're talking about something that you really do love. Like maybe if we're talking about a TV show. Maybe you really love a TV show. You'd probably be hard to break in that. Like, like, no, I know for a fact because I watch it and I love that. So right. mental toughness may be in a different subject. 
right. my mental toughness was in sports. It was not right. possible. So, right. you know, you just have to find it and tap into it. Right. So Gloria asked us, how did you get over certain big mistakes? Like if you, if you, and, you know, going back to the, going back to, you know, when you met, missed one of the free throws at WSU or, you know, as, as a player, anytime the, the real elite athletes, they want to be in the situation where the weight is on their shoulders. How did you get over, you know, mistakes that you made that you felt may have cost your team or somewhere you felt you should have performed better and how'd you move on? You don't get over it. You don't get over it. That's the people. I think that's the biggest cliche is I just went to the gym and, and just worked on it a million times. No, you let it burn you up inside until you 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 are biting at the bit to have that opportunity again. Right. Don't try to throw it away. Let it burn you up inside. Let it kill right. you. Let it let it drive you. Right. And then when that opportunity comes again, you'll be waiting for it. Like you'll be seeking it. Right. Right. So you was thinking. So you knew you was thinking about that every day at the WSU when you it when you missed them. Every free throws. day. Of course, I went to the gym and worked on my free throws and did more right. and more. But I couldn't wait for that opportunity. Right. I never was like, oh, man, forget those three free throws. I think right. that's one thing our youth has bad right now is they don't like to show vulnerability. Right. You know, everybody's like, man, everybody's so cool. Right. They don't want to put it on the line. They're scared of being vulnerable. You don't want to put it on the line. Because right. you, if you fail, now I ain't cool. It's right. okay to fail. Exactly. Exactly. You ain't fail, you're not trying. Uh, so what Gavin asked, what were some of the players, who were some of the players that you looked up to and you idolized when you, once you got past college? When I, Aside I, from Iverson Kobe being my, obviously. Iverson was my favorite player in high school. Then when I really started watching the game, like watching it, watching it, Kobe Bryant became my favorite player by far and away. Um, because I felt like he had no weaknesses. I, I, I can't really hear you, Deb. Your, your head might be on the uh, I feel like. I felt like Kobe Bryant and in high school was Iverson because I liked Iverson was for the culture. Obviously he had the braids, he had the tattoos and all right. All of that stuff. But once I really started digging into the game, Kobe Bryant by far and away was my favorite player because he w he was the best and he outworked everybody. Right. right. So when I started seeing that, I was like, Oh my God, that's different. Right. And uh he just he had no fear of nothing. You know, obviously right. Iverson didn't have no fear, but Kobe was just like he was just a master player, and I, right. I just felt like he was my favorite player right away. And then once I, once I went pro, once I once I went pro and was in, on my journey um, of going pro, like Gary Payton was really close, Jamal Crawford really close, really pushed me. I think Jamal Crawford. I give him a lot of credit because Jamal made it. In my opinion, he made it real for local guys to make the league. Right because we can reach out and touch him. Right. You know, Jason Terry made the league. Uh, and he would come back, but only a selected few would get to play with him and touch right. him. And right. Jamal, every kid in the neighborhood has his phone number. Right. So when right. you can reach out and touch somebody who's there. Right. It becomes realistic for you. You're like, man, I can do that. I can score. Right. 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 Like, and I think that was a big thing for me and Brandon and Nate, you know, guys in Trey and everybody else to just always be there. So then once we became who we were, we tried to follow in with Jamal's path, which was coming back and being part of the community and making the guys think that it was realistic for them to make it. And obviously that's what the DeJounte's and the Tony Rotons and, right. and the Zach Levine's and all those guys are going to do. They're right. not going to go hide up in their big mansions right. and just work out. They're going to come back and touch right. the youth. Did did Jamal used to did did Jamal tell you that that was his plan to kind of try to change the culture of guys who made it from here? Or is that just who he was? I just think that's who he was. I just think he loved the game so much and he wanted to go wherever there was a run. He right. didn't care the age of the kid or anything. He's like, I'm right. going to play. Right. And uh, he didn't know. I don't think at the time he knew the lies that he was affecting. Yeah, no idea. And, he still don't know. And I think he sees the residuals now from it. I think he sees because you have all these. You, you have this surge of, of talent coming up. And, you know, he's still, you know, he was year 19, he still can touch him. But now you have guys who's carrying the flag. You know, he, you know Jamal's kind of passing off the, the, the torch. And you For have sure. the DeJounte's and you have those guys in the IT's and you have those guys who now have the torch and are doing an unbelievable job with it. Right. Last last question, man. Um, we have a, we have a, a good group of, of – 
juniors and seniors, boys and girls that are kind of concerned, you know, with the coronavirus and, you know, how they're still going to get recruited and and how, you know, what what that means for their AAU season since it's most likely going to get canceled or if not, they might be able to play sometime in July. What is your guys, what did you, what would be your advice and what are some of the things that you guys are doing at the University of Washington to still make sure that you guys are still touching, keep in touch with your recruits and what would you recommend that the juniors and seniors in the local area and really across the nation should be doing right now? I'll, I mean, I'll, I'm not sure because it changes. Uh, right now, we, the most we can do with our guys is we, 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 we try to have a Zoom meeting with our players daily. Mm -hmm. um, and every morning we check in, we try to give them we try to give them, you know, some inspiration as far as getting up and working out. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, you got to recruit to that. You want guys whose fire is burning, which you don't have to press the button. They 100%. press the button themselves. Absolutely. Um, but uh, what I would say to, to, to juniors and seniors that, that are in, in this, you know, this, this bad climate, is I would say keep working. I would say every morning, I know it doesn't seem like you may have the opportunity that you thought you were going to have, but it'll work out for you. It'll right. work out for you. You don't know how, and that goes back to that 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 advice that I got when I was young as, as far as staying in my tunnel, stay in your tunnel, work, work. Don't take, don't don't look up. Just keep working, and eventually that call will come, that letter will come, 